The U.S. formally withdrew from a decades-long intermediate-range missile treaty with Russia. There is now just one active nuclear treaty between the world's two largest nuclear powers, the U.S. and Russia. What does that mean for the world? CNN's Barbara Starr and Kylie Atwood, they join us now. But Barbara, let's, let's begin with this. Uh, it, the U.S. has said for years that Russia has violated this treaty. They gave Russia opportunities to, to, to pull back, perhaps renegotiate. That didn't happen. So now a formal withdrawal by the U.S. Uh, and the U.S. is already testing missiles that would have been banned by that treaty. What are we learning? Well, they may test them in the coming months. That's the plan right now that the U.S. would step in. It's really important to understand intermediate range, what we're talking about and why it's so important to everyone. We're talking about the prospect of missiles in Europe. Russia has deployed already several battalions of these intermediate range missiles on its territory. What can Russia do with them? In conflict, they could target European cities, airports, ports, uh, military bases, civilian infrastructure, basically make it much more difficult for Europe to respond in a crisis and make it especially difficult for U.S. forces to quickly get to Europe and defend the continent if it were to come to that. So that's why you see the U.S. now in response to Russia moving ahead with its own intermediate range missile program, missile effort. They are in the very earliest stages of testing what they have, seeing what they can make work, and trying to get the funding from Congress to move ahead. It could result in the coming months, years possibly, in missiles, U.S. missiles being placed in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. You would have to get basing rights for it, and but it, you know, it steps up the arms control race mm -hmm. and it puts Europe right in the crosshairs of this superpower competition, if you will. The jobs added 164,000. That's exactly, exactly what our consensus of economists uh, had, had forecast. And that's right in line with kind of the average for the first six months of this year. But I want you to look at May and June, you guys. May was revised down to 62,000. And June, while better, was also down, downwardly revised. So a little weaker job creation than we had expected and kind of holding in here, but not as robust as last year. I mean, look at this year. Uh, on average, last year, it was 223,000 net new jobs a month. So we're running below average in terms of job creation. What about the unemployment rate? Right where it has been, 3.7%. We do know that about 370,000 workers entered the workforce, and that's good news. The longer you have a strong hiring situation, the more people who've been out of the labor market get confident and come back in and dip their toe. And so you like to see that, and that's probably why you saw that uh, sitting right there. I want to talk about sectors, because a couple of interesting factors here. Business, in, in, in particular here, this is like software engineering, computer systems design, and related services. That industry is about a third of the employment gains in that group, something that I don't know how to do, so I could not do that job. Healthcare, 30,000 there, and manufacturing. Can I read you what they say about the manufacturing report, the Department of Labor? They say, employment little changed, and so far this year in 2019, manufacturing little change. Job gains in the industry last year were 22,000 a month. So manufacturing also running below kind of below speed here in terms of job growth. That could be tariffs and trade war. And that's something that we're watching these numbers very, very carefully. I have covered this uh, controversial gun shop and its billboards before. Many times the billboards have had an anti-Muslim feel, but this one goes above and beyond. And of course, as you've already noted, it shows the four congresswomen of color who are known as the squad. It depicts them as the four horsemen cometh. It's a reference to the apocalypse, but it's scratched out the cometh word and has replaced it with our idiots. It is signed the deplorables. Here's the thing. Anti-gun and civil rights groups say that this only could inspire anger, hatred, perhaps even violence against these four members of Congress. It piles onto the hateful language that the president's already used. The billboard company says it's going to take the billboard down. It says somehow the content of that sign managed to get past their management desk, and they've apologized. The gun shop, though, is totally unapologetic and, in fact, says it'll take the billboard and turn it into a bumper sticker. Here's the owner defending the language. We don't like their message of turning this country into a socialist country. That's the message. Nothing more to read than that. Well, they're calling us racist. I mean, I don't care if it was four white women, four white guys that have their view, they'd be on the billboard. And I will show you that there is a litmus test you have to pass to get your bumper sticker. It says you not only show up at the store, 
you must eat a piece of bacon. Again, a reference to Muslims who, of course, don't eat pork. And then you must tell the gun owner you're voting for Trump in 2020 to get the bumper sticker. Snowflakes and liberals, the Facebook page says, are not eligible. Well, Brooke, this had been a highly controversial naming for the director of national intelligence. The president had made this announcement last Sunday uh, via tweet. And in the same medium, now just five days later, uh, the president announcing that he is recalling that, in essence, uh, saying that John Ratcliffe, congressman of Texas, will no longer be named the director of national intelligence. Brooke, let me just read to you this series of two tweets that just came out moments ago from the president. He writes, our great Republican congressman John Radcliffe is being treated very unfairly by the lamestream media. Rather than going through months of slander and libel, I explained to John how miserable it would be for him and his family to deal with these people. John has therefore decided to stay in Congress where he has done such an outstanding job representing the people of Texas and our country. I will be announcing my nomination for DNI shortly. Now, Brooke, this was such a controversial choice because Ratcliffe has a very thin resume when it comes to foreign policy and intelligence. When you compare what he has done uh, in his career, uh, both in Congress and before, it pales in comparison to predecessors like Dan Coats, who is stepping down in a few days, uh, as well as James Clapper. Uh, and more than that, when we started digging into his bio, into his past, what he claimed as national, ex uh, national security expertise was his time as a U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Texas, right on his congressional page. He writes mm -hmm. in his bio that he put terrorists in prison. We here at CNN have done a search of terrorism uh, cases that were prosecuted in that in eastern Texas. We didn't find any examples of him being a prosecutor. His office hmm. uh, couldn't give us any examples of him being a prosecutor. And then on top of all that, he has spent years both behind closed doors in congressional uh, interviews with, with uh, intelligence officials, as well as repeated appearances on Fox News, blasting the intelligence community that he intended to lead. So for all sorts of reasons, it was a highly questionable choice that was not only being slammed by Democrats on Capitol Hill, but was met with very tepid response at best by Republicans as well, Brooke. And, and this is clear, uh, clearly the president saw that, heard that, and knew that he was going to have a real uphill battle in getting Ratcliffe confirmed.